This recipe is my attempt to make a traditional southern pan-fried chicken as easily as possible. The hardest part, for beginners at least, will be cutting up a whole raw chicken into at least eight pieces. The reason you'll probably need to do that is because you need a small chicken. Three to three and a quarter pounds is perfect, I think. The chicken pieces that they sell pre-cut at grocery stores, in the States at least, are usually from bigger, older birds, four or five pounders maybe. You need a little one for fried chicken, and you can usually only buy that whole. Even then, this three and a half pounder was the smallest I could get, and that's the upper maximum of any bird that I would consider frying. If you're scared about cutting this up, I'm gonna get you through it. The first part is the most gruesome. You cut out the chicken's backbone with a pair of kitchen shears. Just snip up one side of the spine, then snip up the other. With a small chicken, it shouldn't take too much grip strength. Freeze that for stock if you're one of those people. Flip the bird around, and this is what is amusingly referred to as a spatchcocked chicken, which is great for roasting whole. But we're gonna take a big, sharp chef's knife and cut between the two breasts right through the breastbone. That might take some force, so commit to it. We now have two half chickens, and without the backbone, there's almost nothing holding the leg quarters to the breast quarters, just some skin and a little flap of flesh. Pull the leg out away from the breast and cut through the skin connecting them. With that opened up, you should be able to see this very thin area of meat connecting the two quarters. Just slice through it on the board. You might catch a rib with your knife, just crunch through it, I say. Then to separate the leg from the thigh, I cut between them until I hit bone. Then I pick them up and hyperextend that joint, literally dislocate it. Ideally, it just pops apart like this one did. And then all you gotta do is cut through the remaining meat on the other side. Now here is the breast with the wing attached. Some people fry this thing whole. I think that is way too much meat. Some people just cut off the wing, but what I like to do is go up two thirds of the way from that thin point and then cut straight down right through the bone. All right, for review, let's do this again with the other half. Pull the leg away from the breast and cut through the skin between them. You'll see a thin flap of flesh connecting the quarters. Just slice through that. Grab the leg quarter. Cut into the crook between the leg and the thigh until you hit bone. One hand on the thigh, one hand on the leg, hyperextend the joint. Sometimes the joint won't pop apart, but it will open up to where you can see the sinew connecting the joint. Once it's exposed, it's really easy to fit your knife right into it and then cut straight down to the board. There's your leg and thigh. Now grab the breast, go up two thirds of the way from the point and cut straight down with some force right through the bone. There you go. Eight nice tidy pieces of chicken, all of pretty similar size. I'd call that enough for four people. Eat more fried chicken than that and it's just gonna end your whole day right there. Time to season, really aggressively, lots of salt. These are thick pieces of meat that are gonna have a big thick crust on them, lots of pepper. Then I sprinkle over onion powder, garlic powder, and you gotta pour out a little cayenne for Chef John. Flip the pieces around and put the same stuff on the other side. If you wanted an herbal note, I'd suggest some dried sage and thyme. Then I just mop up the seasoning that's left on the board with the big sides of those pieces that haven't gotten much seasoning yet. Okay, now some people would dry cure these pieces in the seasoning just like this for a few hours before breading and frying. I've tried that, that works really nice and it gets you a crispy skin. But I like that Southern style fried chicken that's brined in buttermilk. The normal thing to do would have been to mix my seasoning in with buttermilk and then submerge my chicken, but I think that's too hard. I don't wanna do math and to calculate the proper salinity of a brine solution. I can eyeball it by just seasoning the meat. The size and shape of the pieces tell me how much to put on. Yes, I know I left out a leg. All the pieces go into a Ziploc bag, and rather than submerge them, I pour in just enough buttermilk to coat the pieces in a thick paste of seasoning and buttermilk. That was maybe half a cup. It gets you the exact same flavor while wasting far less seasoning and buttermilk. Speaking of buttermilk, I mentioned in my strawberries with pound cake video that you can approximate buttermilk by adding a splash of vinegar to regular milk. I'm gonna test whether that works with fried chicken by using it on this leg. It gets its own little baggie. Throw the bag on a plate, throw the plate in the fridge, and I brine for a full 24 hours. Some people will say that makes the pieces too salty. I think they come out just right, but you could get away with less time. All right, next day. For breading, I use a big Tupperware and a rack. Get the chicken out to start warming up. That'll help it cook evenly. Dump two cups of flour in the Tupperware. Put in a teaspoon of salt and the magic ingredient, baking powder, a heaped teaspoon. I resisted this for years. I thought that it would make the crust cakey, but it doesn't. It makes it light and crispy. And then I just grind in a bunch of pepper and that's it. This is really just precautionary seasoning. There's plenty of seasoning on that chicken already that's gonna mix with the flour, you'll see. 
and I do not put any garlic or onion powder in the flour because it burns so easily. I want it protected underneath the outermost crust layer. Nah, a little more cayenne for Chef John. Put the lid on and shake to combine everything. Okay, as I pull each piece of chicken out, I'm just scraping it against the bag to get off the drippiest drips of buttermilk. I'll put four pieces into the Tupperware at a time, then put the lid on and shake to coat. Pull those out onto a rack, and no, I'm not putting anything under the rack. I'm gonna have to wipe down this whole table anyway, so there's no point. All right, rest of the chicken goes in the flour, including our experimental leg brined in milk spiked with vinegar. Lid goes on, shake it up. Vinegar leg is on the right. Vinegar leg is on the right. Don't let me forget, vinegar leg is on the right. Now that's just the primer coat of crust. The top coat will adhere a lot better if we use some egg. So I crack an egg into my bag and I just beat it up with my fingers, combining it with all of the remaining buttermilk seasoning paste. And all the chicken goes back in the bag whence it came. If you thought my crust was gonna be under seasoned, think again, it's getting another dose. Now, as each piece comes out again, I'm making sure that it's got an even thin coating of egg sludge and I shake it up again in the flour, four pieces at a time. Vinegar leg is on the right, vinegar leg is on the right. Now I'd let these pieces sit on the rack for a good half hour. Some people call this step drying. I think that's wrong. I think it's wetting. I think the flour particles are hydrating in the egg and buttermilk and that's gonna help the crust hang together. To the oven. If you have a very, very large frying pan, you might be able to fry all eight pieces at the same time. They might fit in there, but with most ranges, you're gonna get uneven heat. The middle is gonna be hotter than the rim. The pieces in the middle might burn. You could cook the chicken in two batches in sequence, but I'd rather fry in two smaller pans simultaneously, two 10-inch skillets. These are non-stick, but I don't think that really matters. This is a good-sized pan of which to own multiples anyway because it's so versatile, and these were 25 bucks each. We'll also need a rack for draining, and this is one of those times I think a meat thermometer really helps. Vegetable oil or peanut oil or anything neutral goes in, and I'm just starting with a half inch of oil. The chicken is gonna displace a lot, raising the oil level, and we can always add more oil if we need it. I'll put the burners on medium heat and wait a few minutes until I see the oil kind of swirling around on its own. I lay the pieces in skin side down because the first side we cook is gonna look a little bit nicer in the end. Another advantage of using two pans is you can put all of the white meat in one and all of the dark meat into another. They cook differently, so it's great to have independent control over them. There's the four breast pieces. Now here come the thighs and legs. Vinegar leg is on the right. Vinegar leg is on the right. Copy that. Vinegar leg is on the right. Now here's what I think is the best temperature at which to fry chicken. It is not a roaring boil. It's not even a sizzle. It's more of a fizzle. I had to turn both of these burners down to virtually their lowest setting. I just want the oil kind of fizzing. Let's find out what temperature fizzing is. Wow, 250 Fahrenheit, that's all. You might think I'm crazy. You might think I'm never gonna get crispy chicken at such a low fry temperature, but here's why this works. These are big, thick pieces of chicken with bones still in them. They need to cook a long time to cook all the way through. If I were to fry these at 350, the crust would be way too dark by the time the meat was cooked, maybe even burned. I see that on Instagram all the time. I like my fried chicken blonde going on gold, never dark brown. If the crust is still looking pale as the meat is getting close to done, we can just turn up the heat at the end to crisp everything off really quickly. I flipped these after 15 minutes when I could see the crust on the underside had fully formed. Throughout this process, you want your oil level to come halfway up the sides of the chicken. I already had to add more oil to the white meat pan because those pieces are so tall. And even then, this one piece is getting crazy tall as its proteins contract and it bunches up. Here's the best solution if this happens to you. Stand it up on its end. Mount Cluckmore. All right, time to start checking the temperature. You're looking for 160 in the white meat take lots of measurements. You're gonna get a lot of weird readings as you hit pockets of oil or pieces of bone that'll be way hotter than the bulk of the meat. The old fashioned way to check if it was done was to pierce it and look at the color of the juice that spills out. See that red juice coming out of the leg in the back there? That's how you know it's not done. The juice should be clear. You can see at this point, I'm letting the oil get hotter. The chicken is mostly cooked, so now it's safe to start coloring the crust. It's been another 15 minutes since I flipped them, and at this stage, I like to flip them again, just making sure that all sides are really crunchy. I've got my heat up to medium now. The white meat is reading 160 to 165. This bird is cooked. 
out it comes to the rack. Again, I'm gonna have to wipe down the whole range. There's no point in putting something under that rack. Don't at me. Vinegar leg is on the right. Roger Wilco, vinegar leg is on the right. I say let these cool for a good 10 minutes on the rack before you eat. That was 35 minutes of cooking total. If we'd been frying a bigger bird, that would have taken way longer. It wouldn't have cooked as evenly and there'd be way too much meat relative to the crust. Vinegar leg is on the right. That's why it's worth cutting up your own three pounder. Man, I'll make one big chicken mountain. That'll be better for the thumbnail. Vinegar leg is on the right. And let's taste it. We're seeing if chicken brined in fake buttermilk tastes the same as real buttermilk. Holy crap, that's good. Lauren tried both legs too, and we agreed that the real buttermilk leg tastes a little better, but it's a pretty subtle difference that I doubt I would have noticed in the absence of a direct comparison. At cleanup time, you could filter your fry oil through a cheesecloth and use it again, but that's not a thing that I'm actually going to do. I just take it outside and bury it in my vegetable garden. It's good fertilizer, and you know that you can't send this stuff down your drain, right? It'll bust your pipes, and that is not a euphemism. You don't actually need to dig a hole. I just want to totally preclude the possibility of my children splashing around in an oil puddle. So how do you think I did? This video was my entry in a little competition between myself and Tim over at Kitchen and Craft. Check out his channel. He's good. He's like me, but with a much nicer camera. He made his own fried chicken video, and for the first few days after these videos are up, you can vote on who made it best. So here's how the rules work. Go to the pinned comment at the bottom of either video and simply reply with the name of the person you want to vote for. Just say Adam or Tim. At 8 p.m. on the Sunday following this release, 8 p.m. Eastern time in the U.S., we will stop taking votes and we we will tabulate the results and we will determine who won and we will announce that winner on Monday. The winner will get profits? I don't know. Just remember this is just for fun, so I hope you vote and I hope you keep your comments positive. We're not making world peace here, we're just making chicken, though honestly this chicken is almost that good.